The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and education. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us on today's program is Dr. Philip Thompson, Associate Professor of Political Science at Barnard College, one who's had experience working in the political arena as well as the academic arena. Uh, Phil, glad to have you talking with us today on African American Legends. Thank you. And That's many right. of the African American legends are political figures. That's right. And over the time that you've been studying politics, African American politics in particular, what do you see as the pivotal issues that have confronted African Americans from a political point of view? I think the uh, pivotal issue throughout African American history has been one of democracy. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, in white politics, uh, the media may focus or politicians may focus on whether they're conservatives or liberals. Uh, for African Americans, there was a much more basic question until very recently, which was, could you even vote? Mm -hmm. uh, were you even allowed uh, the basic rights mm -hmm. that other white Americans uh, took for granted? And even since 1965, I still think that democracy is the pivotal issue that's facing the African American community. Mm -hmm. Well, de define democracy a little bit more because I know when we wave the flag, when we talk about democracy, we talk about baseball and apple pie and the 4th of July. But I think you mean something slightly different than that. Well, I think most people think of democracy simply as the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And that is a uh, part of what democracy is. But democracy means more than that. Democracy also means uh, the right of, of anyone and the right of any group to participate fully in the decisions that affect mm -hmm. them in society. So democracy also means that we have legislative bodies where African Americans simply are not present, but they also have power. They have a voice in determining policy. And as we can see in many state legislatures or in Congress, um, even though you have African Americans there, they are not a majority. And we have majority rule uh, mm -hmm. voting systems uh, which means that if white Americans don't agree with African Americans, they are in fact powerless in those bodies. And we find in legislature after legislature that when African Americans push demands such as full employment mm -hmm. or other things the black community is really concerned about, they are basically isolated uh, and they can't push that kind of legislation. Well, let's talk about democracy in the context of American democracy vis-a-vis -vis other forms of democracy. We really have a two-party system. And in other countries, we have multi-party systems which bring about coalitions. We now are talking about coalition building, coalition building with people of different ethnic backgrounds, uh, different issues, et cetera. But in the context of the two-party system, where you have the majority party, the one that wins the election, and the minority, how does that affect African Americans' power in uh, elected politics? Uh, we have uh, what's called a winner-take-all system. Mm -hmm. um, and 50% of the vote plus one, uh, mm -hmm. you win the presidency, you win the gubernatorial ship, mm -hmm. you win elected office. Many countries have a proportional representation mm -hmm. system where if a group uh, or a candidate wins or a party wins 15% of the vote, then they get 15% mm -hmm. of the seats mm -hmm. uh, in the legislative body. In addition to that, uh, in many places, uh, in many countries that have strong ethnic conflict, or diversity, they have power sharing arrangements where a group such as African Americans would receive funding for schools in the African American mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And issues of schooling and education would not be decided by a body composed of every ethnic group. It would be decided by a body composed of a particular ethnic group, in this case, African Americans. Now, Professor Lana Guarnier has written about proportional representation. There's been a lot of debate about that. But one of the things that always comes across my mind, if the thing has worked for 200 years, the oldest democracy in the world, there must be something right about it. And the question is, how fast should we hasten to change something that has been working? Well, I don't think it's worked well for 200 years. We did have a civil war. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. uh, we continue to have voting rights legislation. Mm -hmm. We continue to have mammoth problems in getting policies mm -hmm. to help improve the condition of African Americans mm -hmm. and others. So I don't think it's worked for African Americans 
for 200 years very I well. I would agree with that, but right. in terms of a society where we don't have a monarchy, we don't have a dictator, uh, that part has worked. Now, of course, you're really raising the questions about what's now happening. Even in challenging the two-party system, we have the right-wing Republicans, the moderate Republicans, the moderate Democrats, and the extreme, uh, not many, very liberal Democrats. And as we see legislation like the uh, uh, tax cut legislation, the uh, capital gain, we right. see different folks working within this mm -hmm. to move things in directions that they want. Mm -hmm. And as African Americans, we are particularly concerned with things like employment, mm -hmm. uh, like education, like health care, mm -hmm. like fairness in the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I don't think proportional representation is a, an end all. Mm -hmm. It's just a tool. Uh, it's just one means of increasing power for minority groups. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to point out that America is one of the least permissive societies, least mm -hmm. tolerant when it comes to the issue of power and representation for minority groups. Even mm -hmm. in England, Scotland mm -hmm. has the right to have Scottish schools, mm -hmm. which are publicly funded by England. Mm -hmm. um, in America, that would raise mm -hmm. howls and cries from every corner. Mm -hmm. Uh, India, other countries in Northern Europe, they all have systems that give more power to minorities than what we have here in this country. That's just for context. We don't do a lot to ensure that minorities have a voice here. On the other hand, there are things that we could do on our own within the existing system without even changing the majority rule requirement. And I guess we could talk about some of those mm -hmm. things. Now, what are some of them? Well, we might uh, set up our own policy institutes so that when we elect someone, they know what uh, they are doing. Mm -hmm. um, many of our elected officials, once they get into office, they really don't have the first idea, since they're new, mm -hmm. um, about how to make reforms in different agencies that mm -hmm. affect policy. Um, and there's no place they can turn where they can get this kind of detailed, specific information, mm -hmm. or even learn from the past experiences of other black elected mm -hmm. officials or progressive whites or Hispanics who have tried to do similar things. There is nothing like that in this country. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have no uh, daily black newspapers except in one city that I know of. That's Oakland, California. Um, we have uh, no, uh, pardon me? I think one of the papers in New York is uh, daily. A daily? Yeah, the Daily Challenge. Well, the Daily Challenge, yeah. which is a circulation in Queens, is in it primarily? Brooklyn, Queens, is it Brooklyn? Right. Okay. But your, your it. essential point is correct. Uh -huh. uh, it's just that uh, sometimes when you say, we don't have anything right. as an African-American, I say, yeah, we've got a lot. Now, the point is that we need to have more dailies that focus on African-Americans. Sure, media is particular. just an area that we need to pay a lot mm -hmm. more attention to. Um, and it's one in which we could have an a lot of influence, not only on mobilizing African-Americans, educating them as to the issues, but for other groups as well. But what about our radio, though? We have talk radio, WLIB and others. Well, in, in New York City, we have WLIB. I think talk radio is one of mm -hmm. the few uh, outlets that we have. Mm -hmm. I understand that that is being threatened somewhat by recent legislation mm -hmm. and telecommunications law. Um, I don't think we paid enough attention mm -hmm. to that. Um, the TV networks are uh, redividing new air channels mm -hmm. that are coming on board. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we really paid a lot of attention to that. Now the we as is a who? community. The African American uh, elected officials, right. African American uh, civil rights organizations, mm -hmm. um, African American academics. Mm -hmm. right. um, I think all of us um, have not paid enough mm -hmm. attention to these issues. Uh, Using that as an object lesson, why is it you think something like that would slip by? I happen to agree with your analysis. Why did that slip by? I, I think um, that African Americans who uh, do work in this area, who do research in this area, are pretty isolated right now. Mm -hmm. um, they are not part of any organization or network um, where they can raise issues or call the alarm or, or point attention to these things. It's interesting that at our height of electoral representation, I think we were maybe at our weakest point in terms of civic community mm -hmm. uh, organization and networks internally. How can we change that? Well, I, I think two things. One is, I think we have to put electoral politics in perspective. Um, looking back to the 70s, late 60s, 80s, many of us thought you elect someone and then that elected official solves all the problems and right. we can just go about our business. And electoral politics has never been about mm -hmm. that in America. It's only 
a spokesperson for civic organizations and for communities. If the communities aren't organized, if they don't have a, a view or a voice or giving direction to elected mm -hmm. officials, then they're just people sitting up there mm -hmm. occupying space, collecting a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, no single person is smart enough to figure out how to run a country or run a city or run a community. Uh, it really takes the talent and the efforts and the unity of lots of people working together in order to provide that. Well, um, unless you're IBM and then you can mm -hmm. have your own apparatus for that. See, it's very interesting as you talk about this I was thinking about the political leaders of the uh, 19th century and the uh, <coughs> Reconstruction period. I was thinking of uh, uh, Congressman DePriest mm -hmm. from Chicago in the 30s and Adam Powell in the 40s and the, the Wrangles and the Clays and the Kanyas of the 50s and 60s and I was wondering as you talk about the responsibility of communities, to what extent have the elected political figures learned something from this experience? Do you see anything in what's happening today that shows that the elected folks are uh, seeing something differently? When I first went to the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, I think there were five or six Congress people. Uh, it was in September of uh, 97, we have 42, 43 African-American congressmen and congresswomen. Mm -hmm. um, do you think those folks have learned anything from this experience? Do they have, have the black political leaders changed? Has their focus changed? Has their insight changed? I, I think many black elected officials have given up on reforming the system or changing mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. um, I think many of them had high hopes once they got into the legislature or got into office and then uh, when they were outvoted in the legislature or when they saw the economic constraints of being a mayor mm -hmm. and so on they really did not know what to do uh, and were very frustrated and began to focus on survival mm -hmm. um, at the same time I think uh, many elected officials in those positions such as a Charlie Rangel um, would like to do more and would actively work with and support uh, the types of mm -hmm. policy input or civic input that I've been mentioning, but they can't do it all themselves. They can't be in Washington sitting in committee and also back mm -hmm. organizing black intellectuals and black community groups and so on to create a think tank. So I, I think actually that uh, all the wisdom and all the energy doesn't reside in the elected mm -hmm. official, that um, the other institutions in the black community also have to step up to the plate. You mentioned Rangel in particular. He's been there 20 some 25, 26 years. He now has gotten to the point where he's the top Democrat in Ways and Means. And if, in fact, uh, which is the committee that handles all the budget and taxation uh, matters, if uh, Democrats take over the House of Representatives, he would actually be the chair of that, which says something about the role of longevity. At the same time, because uh, he and other people who've been in Congress a long time are in Washington, they don't get back to their districts right. as often. Right. The uh, well-known William Fulbright, who developed the Fulbright Scholarship Program, former president of the University of Arkansas, uh, was defeated in his heyday when he was doing all these wonderful things uh, internationally right. because he didn't relate to his community. That's right. So that is a dilemma. Now, how will these think tanks, uh, composed of people like you and me and, uh, and others, uh, deal with this? Because one of the problems about the academic community, which you and I both know, is that sometimes we get detached mm -hmm. from the realities of life in the mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. So uh, how would you envision this think tank? It's a very interesting idea. Well, I, I think that any sort of think tank that is created has to be led by and linked to um, tenants organizations, trade union locals, mm -hmm. local church organizations, mm -hmm. other community level organizations, if it's going to have any relevance mm -hmm. or effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, because a think tank in and of itself cannot change anything. Mm -hmm. um, and an elected official has to worry about re-election. Mm -hmm. um, and what's in the interest of both the elected official and the think tank is to work on behalf of the community, because then you can actually get support for your ideas uh, and support for your officials. Um, Charlie Rangel is in an interesting position in that he affects tax, he affects pension investment laws, uh, he's in a position to, uh, he and Carl McCall as well as the mm -hmm. state comptroller of the state of New York, are in a position to influence the investment of billions of dollars mm -hmm. of public 
pension monies, mm -hmm. which could be used for economic development in poor communities. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be used to increase incentives for business development in poor communities. Um, and God knows we certainly need jobs and business development in our communities. So that's what we need to be focusing on. Uh, we need to be putting forward ideas to Carl right. McCall, to Charlie Rangel, as to what, what are economically viable investments for public pension funds um, that ordinarily might go into luxury housing development or out overseas, things that can be done right in our own communities. Yeah, an example of what Rangel has done is the Empowerment Zone. The Empowerment Zone provides tax incentives for people who invest and provide jobs in certain inner city communities. I think there's seven over the country, and then there are several other empowerment-related enterprise zones, which is an idea. But talk about a think tank so that people don't think think tank is just a bunch of academicians dreaming up ideological positions. Actually, a good think tank takes a problem, let's say housing or crime or education, and develops different approaches for dealing with some of those issues. Many of the right. conservative think tanks have brought us things like vouchers and privatization, right. uh, some of which might be positive, some, some not. But in terms of getting this think tank going, uh, would you suggest that groups like the Urban League and the Black Trade Unionists and the Congressional Black Caucus and the Black Academics and, uh, get together? Is this a, a concept that you can dream about? Absolutely, and, and also uh, community organizations. We ought to be coming up with new models mm -hmm for how to manage our own communities. One idea, just as an example, mm -hmm. um, I like to talk about is um, why is it that we need to pay other people to manage our communities? Mm -hmm. um, why should we pay the Housing Authority of New York mm -hmm. $10,000 a month to clean up graffiti in some of our housing developments? Mm -hmm. um, why not say to the Tenant Association, if you can clean up graffiti or stop it from happening, we will take the $10,000 a month now we're paying the Housing Authority and give it to you for your tenants association. Mm -hmm. If a community group can keep one person from going to jail, then New York State will save 70, between 50 and $70,000 a year. Mm -hmm. However, the system we have now, if a community group works hard to keep someone out of jail, they don't get 10 cents mm -hmm. for that. The money will probably go back to the suburban taxpayers in the form of a tax cut. Why shouldn't we renegotiate with our criminal justice agencies and say that we're gonna take responsibility for crime and incarceration in our communities, and that we can demonstrate to you that we are lowering incarceration rates coming out of our community, we want you to pay us. The money that you save, uh, that we save for you, to come back in our communities because we are now managing our community. That's just one idea, something that could be done, um, and we could explore ideas in every single realm of, of social life and government in these areas. That's an interesting uh, point you bring up. We've talked about the thousand points of light and volunteerism. It's one thing to volunteer when you're a millionaire and don't have to work, but it's another thing to be held responsible for volunteering and controlling your community when either you personally or your community doesn't get any dollar value for it. So the concept of uh, uh, giving economic re uh, rewards or compensation, whatever, to voluntary groups in the neighborhood is, a, is an excellent concept, but it requires legislation. And that's where we get the political leaders. So the next question I want to talk about is where are the new black political leaders coming from? Because you pointed a kind of a bleak picture that they go in with great idealism and the first year they, everything they come up with gets voted out or doesn't even get into committee. And they say, oh, the hell with it. Let me go and do what everybody else does. Right. Where do you think the new black political leadership will come from? And what will it look like? I. I think that the uh, new, well, two things. One is I think we have a tremendous amount of talent now no question in the African-American community, uh, more so than at any time in our history. Mm -hmm. um, I know lots of black investment mm -hmm. bankers um, who invest money on Wall Street mm -hmm. for all sorts of institutions who would love and want to know how to connect and utilize their skills to help the African-American community. And you Would they be willing to take a job as a legislator at $50,000 a year to do this? Well, I don't know if they See, would, and I don't know if we would want them to. Okay. Um, I, I think there's a need to develop a much broader agenda uh, for black leadership now, mm -hmm. one that encompasses economic development as well as political yeah, representation. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. um, they feel that 
unless we have money and we're, we're focused on building economic institutions, then once we get into office, if we don't have any money, we're going to be spending all of our time running around trying to raise money. So they are interested in a more comprehensive strategy. And we have to create organizations for that conversation to take place. But again, uh, an elected official really doesn't usually have another job. And we pay our elected officials a small amount of money, including our Congress people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've observed is some of the very, very capable African Americans are doing so well in the business field, and that's true with white Americans as well, that you don't attract them. So that raises the question, are there not some other sources? Uh, as you say, many of the activists got into Congress or legislature because they were active in the community. And you, you pointed out that many of them weren't aware of exactly what to do because they didn't know much about the legislative process. But for example, can we have a school for political officials or incipient politicians? I we have a, you're a professor of political science. What are you going to do about that? Absolutely, we can. And I just think it's a matter of us doing it. Mm -hmm. um, again. I know a lot of African Americans in investment banking. Mm -hmm. They're in their early 40s. They're ready to retire. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've made their money to send their kids mm -hmm. to school, to buy their house, and so on. Now they want to know mm -hmm. how to utilize their talents and so forth for the kinds of ideas you just suggested. For but what about school. somebody who works in the post office, works in a civil service, or works in a small business who may not have that resource? Uh, having worked with Jesse Jackson's campaign, as you and I did, or mm -hmm. David Dingen's campaign, mm -hmm. you know that you can raise money mm -hmm. when you don't have a lot mm -hmm. to put on a credible campaign. So mm -hmm. it's a question of getting people's psyche attached and also a focus. Uh, one of the questions you suggested is, why would anybody want to be an elected official in today's climate? Mm -hmm. Answer that for me. I, I think... Um, I wouldn't want to be an elected official in today's climate unless I was connected mm -hmm. okay. to an organization um, that rep had roots mm -hmm. in the community, yeah. that yeah. constantly educated the community, mm -hmm. particularly to support me when I raise controversial mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's no reason for me to mm -hmm. be there except to collect mm -hmm. a paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are lots of, I see young students all the time, and I meet young people all the time who would want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. In, in the lives of their community. It's only they don't see it happening in the elected bodies right now, mm -hmm. and so they don't look to that as a way, an avenue mm -hmm. to make change happen. I think we have to build a movement uh, and an ethic that says political representation means accountability. Mm -hmm. And accountability means on two sides, one of the official to the community, but two of the community mm -hmm. um, to itself mm -hmm. and to its leadership mm -hmm. to go out and organize. And we have to recreate that ethic. I think it's been there in the past. We have to renew it and strengthen it and develop mechanisms for checking up on our mm -hmm. officials and how they vote. One half of black legislators in New York voted for tax cuts mm -hmm. three years ago in the state legislature, mm -hmm. which have cut $6 billion mm -hmm. in programs mainly in our communities. Mm -hmm. Very few people in our community even know about that. And um, the reason they did it, they had to maintain their status in the party. And since the speaker said, vote this way, they voted that way. That's right. But I would submit that probably the single most important thing to get more people involved in politics from the masses of the average person is uh, campaign finance reform. It, it takes so much money now to compete for a political office that that is certainly a uh, disincentive for poor people and people from the community to participate. So it would appear to me that one of the things that we all should be working for would be campaign finance reform and uh, not the phony kind of thing they're talking about in some of the legislation, but real, honest to good. And the best way of doing that is to have public financing of campaigns. I agree wholeheartedly. I think that goes back to the question of democracy, mm -hmm. and we have to define what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, just to uh, say that we have it because, you know, uh, we've been around for 200 years mm -hmm. and it's good enough, I, mm -hmm. I don't think is it. Um, mm -hmm. Campaign finance reform is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, I also think uh, paying attention to the rules by which budgets are, are, are determined, mm -hmm. uh, how the votes are determined and counted mm -hmm. in state legislatures or city councils mm -hmm. are important, whether a majority rule is enough or a mm -hmm. supermajority, mm -hmm. as they have in right. the Senate, mm -hmm. um, whether we need something like that, mm -hmm. uh, which would give us African Americans, other minorities, more power. Mm -hmm. Both of those, I think, are critical um, in terms of reforming democracy so it's more representative of everybody, not just black people, mm -hmm. 
that there are lots of other groups that are frustrated and don't feel they have a voice. Uh, throughout our history, the color question has been the question, as Du Bois said, of the 20th century, probably the 21st century. But with the increase in the population of Hispanic Americans in particular, uh, who will undoubtedly outnumber African Americans in about another 20 years or so, uh, how are African Americans going to have their issues brought up and responded to? We agreed they haven't been responded to as much as we'd like, but clearly the civil rights law was a function of the civil rights revolution, which was black-led and focused on black. Clearly the Voting Rights Act, clearly the affirmative action. Now we have uh, the other minorities. In fact, we won't be the number one minority. How will that affect our political power and the agendas that we pursue? I think it depends on how we handle it. Um, Jewish American groups supported the civil rights movement in the early 60s. Um, and as a result of that, African Americans were very supportive of uh, Jewish causes, including Israel and its mm -hmm. formation uh, in the late 1960s. And there was a workable coalition there. I think Jewish groups benefited a lot from their support mm -hmm. for African Americans in the early 60s. Um, I think it's important now for African American leadership to be on the right side of the issues vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Hispanic uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. um, 100 years ago, Italian immigrants coming into New York, once they established residency, could vote um, before they were citizens in state and local elections. Uh, now, Dominicans who come into this country, even though they pay taxes here, they're residents here, can't vote. Um, that should be a civil rights issue for the African-American community. Um, if Dominicans could vote, if Guyanese could vote in New York, mm -hmm. we would have a completely different mm -hmm. political scenario in the city and the state. Uh, similarly in California, if we had the same laws as we had mm -hmm. for white immigrants 100 years ago yes. now, then we would have a Chicano governor in California. We would not be repealing affirmative action and in California. It would be a different scenario. So we need to be in front of the issue. We have some experience in this country. We need to be sharing that with them and working together for a mutual agenda of empowerment. Okay, I think that's a good point in which to close our conversation today because it is very clear that the 21st century will bring out some real challenges for African Americans, for other minorities, and for the country as a whole. We've been talking with Professor Philip Thompson of Barnard College about African American politics and the future of our country.